now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Demon of the Night. There are two ways of looking at it. Either one believes that they died accidentally from natural causes. Or else we have to admit that there was something in the darkness waiting for them. Waiting for anyone who would be unsuspecting enough to walk alone at night. I leave it up to you. Decide for yourself whether Raphael Sebastian was a maniacal killer. Or whether he was what so many people have called him. A creature of the darkness spawned in the mind of evil in the darkness of night. Running on all fours to leap upon his unsuspecting victim. He came to our town on the midnight train. Why I happened to be there at the station, I attribute to restlessness. Sheriff Craig was there, too. Who's that? Ken Parker, Sheriff. What are you doing down here? I couldn't sleep. She's right on time. Yeah. Why did you come down here? I don't know. Figured I might as well walk down to the station and see who might be getting off the midnight train. Then you knew he was coming tonight. Who was coming? Sebastian. You mean the man who bought the old Claymore place? That's right. No, I didn't know. I was kind of anxious to see him. It was funny the way he bought the place, wasn't it? Yeah. Calling up at night when the real estate office was shut down. Have an old Matt Ryerson describe the place to him over the phone. Then mail him a check from him. My name. Now, this is Ken Park. I'm pleased to meet you. How do you do? Did you come down here to see me? Yes and no. Uh, what do you mean by that? I was kind of interested in you. I mean, the way you bought the old Glamour place and everything. I wanted to see the man who bought it over the telephone. And besides, I couldn't sleep. Who told you I was coming? Old Matt Ryerson, the real estate agent. And you, Mr. Parker, why did you come down? I don't know, Mr. Sebastian. I guess I couldn't sleep either. Well, it's, it's rather late. You should not... Oh, here he comes. I must talk to him about being late. It's been very pleasant meeting you, gentlemen. I hope that we may meet again quite soon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sebastian. I imagine we'll be seeing you around. I imagine you will, Sheriff. Good night. Good night. I got a funny feeling about that man, Ken. How do you mean? I can't explain it. His eyes look sort of uh, funny. And his hands. Did you notice his hands? Yes, I did. Notice how they were just covered with hair? Thick and furry, just like an animal. I was a little surprised that the sheriff had fastened upon the same things I had. There was only one light on the deserted station platform, but Raphael Sebastian had stopped directly beneath it while he waited for his car. There was something strange about his eyes. But the thing which had set an unaccountable tremor of fear through me was his hands. They were small hands, graceful and well-formed. They were covered with a thick coating of hair, and as Craig had said, they did remind one of the fur of an animal. Perhaps I should mention that I own the paper in this small town we live in. It was always news to us to note the departures and arrivals in the town. So I knew that Saturday, when the Gazette came out, it would have an item about Sebastian's arrival. Both Sheriff Craig and I lived in the outskirts of the town. So I drove him back to his house and stopped in for a cup of coffee. I hope you're 
don't mind it being a little strong. That's the way I like it, Sheriff. Sue always makes it so weak I can't stand to drink the stuff. Tastes like dirty dishwater. Cream and sugar? No, no, I like it flat. <laughs> Appreciate the flavor, huh? Mm, so do I. Paper getting along all right? Mm-hmm. You've been doing a good job since your father died, Ken. I didn't... Listen. Yeah, I hear it. Must be a dog. Ain't no dog. No dog ever howls like that. Then what is it? Haven't been any of those critters anywhere near here in a long time. You mean that's a wolf? That's what it is. Shot a lot of them when I was young. Probably out looking for food. Maybe. There it is again. Kind of gives you the creeps, don't it? A little. Sounds like a big one. Maybe we'd better go up. What was that? I don't know. It sounded like a window breaking. Isn't any mistake in that sound? That was a scream. Come on. Right. The only other house out here is Widow Brady's. Uh, scream must have come from there, then. Don't see any lights on. Definitely came from our house. I don't know it. Miss Brady! Miss Brady! Maybe the door is unlocked. No, no, she always leaves it locked. Mrs. Brady! Listen, that sounds like an animal. Come on! We're gonna break this door open. You ready? Yeah. All right. Stand together. Let's do it again. She's sleeping on the first floor bedroom. Just follow me. This is right, eh? The light's right here. Mrs. Brady. Something, some animal must have been in here. Look at her. It's what a horrible way to die. We'll return to the tale of the Demon of the Night in just a moment. Now to the Hall of Fantasy and the tale of The Demon of the Night. I had stopped at Sheriff Craig's house for a late cup of coffee. We had just returned from the station and our first meeting with Rossi and Sebastian. The scream had echoed in the night. We raced outside to see what was wrong. What we found was death. That wolf again. You think that wolf killed Mrs. Brady? That's what it looks like, doesn't it? What are you going to do? That animal's got to be killed. That's what I'm going to do. Craig went out by himself that night in an attempt to track the animal. But though the tracks were quite clear outside the broken window, it was impossible to follow them. By morning, a light rain had sprung up, and all traces of the tracks disappeared. I was at the paper the following day, getting everything ready to go to press. Ken. Ken! Oh, Alice, I'm sorry, <laughs> darling. I didn't see you come in. I'm beginning to feel jealous of that typewriter. What are you writing now? Well, the story of what happened last night. It's already all over the town. Yes, I know. But they'll read about it just the same. Matt Ryerson told me that... An animal had killed Mrs. Brady. That's right. He said something about a big wolf. Is that true? As far as Craig and I know. Well, they'd better catch the animal and kill it, Ken. The town's getting panicky. Well, Craig was going to trail it, but when the rain came this morning, there wasn't any trail to follow. Oh, it's not raining now. Don't you see, Alice? The rain washed the tracks away. You two talking over your marriage plan? No, Sheriff. We were talking about what happened last night. I thought you might be different. Old town's talking about that. Anything new, Sheriff? Ah, the thing. Town's getting all head up about it. I don't like it. Anything I can do for you, Sheriff? Hey, Ken, I'm going out to see that Sebastian fella. Want to come along? Of course. Sebastian? Came in last night on the midnight train. Well, what are you going out to see him for? Ah, just to see him, that's all. Oh. Sheriff 
Sheriff Craig and I went out to his car, got in and drove out to the old Glamour mansion. It was a few miles out of town, well back from the highway. We turned into the gravel road that led to the house. It'll be pretty nice to see this old place fixed up. Certainly gone to ruin since Claymore died. It will be nice to see it fixed up, but I... But what? Yeah, I don't know. This killing's got me down. Don't worry, Craig. You'll get the wolf. I hope so. Well, we're here. Now, let's go. All right. <sighs> All that rain this morning has certainly turned into a nice day. Kind of a day I like to go fishing. Yeah, me too. I guess that servant of his must have come out early to get the house in order. He was the knocker kid. Good afternoon, Sheriff. Afternoon, Mr. Sebastian. Are you here on business? A little. Uh, won't you come in, then? Thanks. You certainly cleaned it up in here. My servant, Carlos, was here for some time. Sit down if you will, huh? Now, what can I do for you? Last night... When you were driving out here, did you uh, see or hear anything? I don't understand. Like a wolf. A wolf. That's right. No, I didn't. Why do you ask? We had a killing in town last night. You mean someone was murdered? Yes. By a wolf. At least that's what we think it is. Uh, what happened? Was someone out walking? No, the wolf broke through a window to enter the house. Oh, that sounds impossible to believe. Yeah, I know. I just want to warn you, living way out here the way you do, to uh, make sure you have plenty of protection. Huh. Do not worry, Sheriff. I am able to protect myself. Did the uh, animal leave any trail? Yes, he did. Yeah, but I couldn't follow it in the dark. And when it was light enough to see, a storm started and washed out the tracks. Oh, that's too bad. Well, you keep your eyes open, Mr. Sebastian. I will, Sheriff. Come on, Ken, let's go. We went outside and got into the car and started back to town. We'd driven for about five minutes before I realized that something was different about Sebastian. I think Sheriff Craig realized it at the same time. Sheriff? What? I just thought of something. So did I. You notice his hands? Yeah. That's what I was thinking, too. There was no hair on them at all. At first, I thought we must have been mistaken the night before, but then I wasn't so sure. Both Sheriff Craig and I had seen his hands the night before. Both of us couldn't be mistaken. We didn't have much time for further speculation, however. I had to get back to the paper. I was behind in my work, and I had to make up for lost time. About 8 o'clock that evening, Alice came down to help me. We worked steadily until almost 11. You are through? Yeah. What time is it? Oh, almost 11. Well, I'd better get you home. Finish up in the morning. Well, I can go home alone if you want to stay here, Ken. No, Alice, I don't want you out in the streets now. Not that there's any chance of that animal returning. Let's go. I've never seen the town look so deserted at 11 o'clock. You're all afraid. Oh, look, there's your afraid. The sheriff. Ah, uh, hello, Ken. I see you're wearing two guns, here. Yeah? That's right. Not going to take any chances. You walking Alice home, Ken? Yes. Well, I might as well go along with you. Everybody must be staying inside. No, not everybody, Sheriff. Look up there. Isn't that Matt Ryerson? Uh, I can't see too well. We need more streetlights in this town. Mister. Yes, I heard it. I don't like this. There's an animal up there. It's tearing him to pieces. No. No, it's running away now. I uh, missed him, Doc on it. Matt. Matt, are you all right? A wolf with a human face. He's dead. Did you... Did you hear what he said, Ken? He said a wolf with a human face. You 
are listening to the tale of the demon of the night on this week's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. We'll return to our story in just a moment. Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Demon of the Night. Sheriff Craig and I were walking out of home. It was after 11 and the streets were deserted and dark. Old Matt Ryerson lay on the ground where he had fallen after the attack. Before our eyes, he died. Did you hear what he said, Ken? He said a, a wolf with a human face. I heard what he said. That thing out there in the darkness, whatever it is, it's got to be killed. What do you mean, Sheriff? Whatever it is. Just what I said. You think it's something besides a wolf? Well, I don't know for sure. What are we going to do with him? There's nothing much we can do. Isn't a pretty sight, is it? I guess I'll call Simmons. Then we'll drop you off, Alice. And then what? You'll come along, Ken. Then you and I'll follow the trail of that killer. It's a good thing that it did rain. The ground's pretty soft. Makes the trail easier to follow. We've been out for almost three hours. I know. I wonder if that critter knows what's following it. Aren't you endowing it with the faculty of reason? Maybe. No animal is capable of reasoning. That's where you're making a mistake. All animals can reason a little, and I know one that can reason a lot. There's only one animal. You mean a man. That's right, a man. A man that can take on the form of a wolf. That's not possible. You should listen to my wife talk. She can tell you some stories that will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. A man that assumes the form of a wolf, that's only legend, folk belief. You figure it your way. I'll figure it mine. That critter's getting closer to us. You sure? Of course I am. We aren't tracking it anymore. It's tracking us. Maybe you've been wondering why I'm carrying two guns tonight. Well, here, yeah, one of them is for you. Thanks. Uh, we better stop. You, uh, notice which way we've been traveling? North. That's right. And what lies north of the town? Nothing. Except the old Claymore place. That's where we've been heading. We aren't more than a half a mile away from it. You're really serious in believing that we're dealing with a werewolf. Dead serious. Listen. I heard something. Keep your eyes open. I can't see anything. Don't talk. Just shoot. Just look. Out. There it is. I see it. You hit it. Uh, we might as well stop. No sense shooting at the shadows. It's too far away by now. Did you notice which way we're going? North. Yeah, just about a half a mile towards the old Glamour place. You and me, we're going there too. We're going to pay Mr. Sebastian a visit. your light again. Uh, yeah, that's right. There's the blood spot again. You got any doubts now where the trail ends? It's only 25 feet away from us. Look, the paw prints end here. That's right. And you see the bare footprints of a man. Now, do you believe me? I guess so. Now, when we get inside, you let me do most of the talking. All right. Here's the knocker. Right. I wonder who'll answer the door, Sebastian or his servant. We don't have long to find out. I think someone's coming. Yes? Oh, it's it's you, Sheriff Craig. And Mr. Parker, what uh, what can I do for you, huh? We'd like to come in and talk a spell. Well, it's it's rather late. What I have to say won't keep. Well, then, come in. How come your servant didn't open the door? Oh, uh, why, he... He left my employ. I guess I must have missed him when he took the train. Yes, you must have. We can talk here. I see you have a bandage on your hand. Did huh? you hurt it some way? I, I cut it. Now, what do you want to talk to me about? About two killings. And I think maybe a third. 
What do you mean? The old woman that was killed last night, Widow Brady. You didn't know her. And Matt Ryerson, he was killed tonight. And your servant, when did he die? You, you're insane. No, we're not, Mr. Sebastian. First time I looked at your hands, I knew there was something wrong about you. They're covered with hair, just like the hair of a wolf. But they're only covered at night, not in the daytime. You, you don't know what you're talking about. And you didn't cut your hands, Sebastian. We shot you when you tried to attack you, us tonight. You have no proof, Craig. You, you're accusing me of being, being a shapeshifter, a werewolf. You, you don't expect people to believe you, do you? I don't care what they believe. We know what you are. We're going to see that you can't kill anyone else. You, you don't think that you can stop me, do you, Craig? Huh? Look at his hands, <laughs> Sheriff. They're yes. changing. Yes, look at me, Craig. This <laughs> way, and we shall see who you are. You will tell making a mistake about that. No. Sebastian is dead. I'll never forget what I saw. Right before our eyes, he changed. First into an animal, and then as he was dying. Back into a man. You'd better forget it if you know what's wise. People aren't going to believe you now that he's dead. If he was alive and the murders went on, and then they'd believe you. But not now. Officially, I killed Sebastian in the line of duty for the murder of three people. Unofficially, and you and I know the truth, I killed a wolf who was the demon of the night. The Mercury Theater on the Air presents Orson Welles as Count Dracula in his own version of Bram Stoker's great novel, Dracula. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Arthur Seward. I'm here tonight to bear witness to the truth of certain events which you may find it hard to believe, but I ask you to believe them. I have here certain documents, telegrams, clippings from the press of the day, memoranda, and letters in various hands. All needless matters have been eliminated so that a history almost at variance with the possibilities of contemporary belief may stand forth as simple fact. I present you first with excerpts from the private journal of Jonathan Harker. I, Jonathan Harker, lawyer's class, article to Peter Hawkins, Esquire of Exeter, England, am writing this journal in the hope that if misfortune overtakes me, it may one day come to the eyes of those who love me. I set out from London on the last day of April to visit one of our clients in Eastern Europe. On May the 3rd, I arrived in Budapest and came after nightfall to Klausenburg on the borders of Transylvania. At Bistritz, there was a letter of welcome for me from our client, informing me that his carriage would await me at the Borgo Pass. It was signed, Dracula. The road was rushed, but still we seemed to fly over it with feverish haste. When it grew dark, there seemed to be some excitement among the passengers. They kept speaking to the driver and looking at me and urging him on to greater speed. The crazy coach rocked on its great leather string. The mountains seem to come nearer to us on either side. Coachman! Coachman! What is it? Where are we? You are nearing your destination, young hair. This is the Borga Pass. There were black, rolling clouds overhead, and in the air the heavy, oppressive sense of thunder. Now, we were 
was good of her. The young hair is not expected after all. You are early tonight, my friend. A calèche with four horses had drawn up beside us. Let me help you, sir. The coachman smiled, and the lamplight fell on a hard-looking mouth with very red lips and sharp-looking teeth as white as ivory. We began to move. I looked back. The coach and its load of passengers had vanished from sight. We swept into the darkness of the past. I struck a match. It was within a few minutes of midnight. And then a dog began to howl somewhere far down the road. The wind was rising, moaned and whistled through the rocks, and the branches of the trees stacked together as we swept along. It grew colder and colder still, and fine powdery snow began to fall. The baying of wolves sounded nearer and nearer, both as though they were closing round us by this side. We kept on ascending, always ascending. The howling of wolves was growing less. Presently, it ceased altogether. And just then, the moon broke through the black clouds, and by its light, I, I saw round us a ring of wolves running alongside the carriage, in silence, with white teeth and lolling red tongues, with long, sinuous limbs and shaggy hair. Welcome to my house. I must have fallen asleep. The carriage had pulled up in the courtyard of a vast ruined castle. The coachman was nowhere to be seen. Welcome to my house. Come freely. Go safely. And leave something of the happiness you bring. Count Dracula? I am Dracula. His face was strong. Very strong. Aquiline. The mouth, so far as I could see under the heavy mustache, was fixed and rather cruel looking with peculiarly sharp white teeth. Mm. You hear me, Mr. Harker? Uh, the wolf? The children of the night, as you say, Mr. Harker. The wolves. Listen. Mm. Come now. There are many things you must tell me tomorrow. Of England and of the estate there you have purchased for me. Ah, uh, yes. The estate is called Carfax, I believe. Yes, that is so. But now I will detain you no longer. You will find your room in readiness. And I advise you not to leave it. During the night. This castle is on the very edge of a terrible precipice. A stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. I explored. There are doors, doors, doors everywhere, and all of them locked. The door to the great hall, the door to the courtyard, every door in the castle is closed, bolted against me. The castle of Dracula is a prison, and I am a prisoner. The next night, I couldn't sleep. So after a few hours, I got up and lighting my candle, I placed my shaving mirror on the dressing table and was just beginning to shave. You still asked this, Mr. Harker. I hadn't seen him, although the reflection of the glass covered the whole room behind me. I turned to the glass again. Count Dracula was close to me, and I could see him over my shoulder, but there was no reflection of him in the mirror. It was blank. I started and cut myself on the side of the throat. The blood was trickling down my neck. Count, my mirror! The blood! The blood! Wipe the blood from your face, Mr. Harker. And take care how you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think in this country. When I woke, I found most of my things were gone. My passport, my notes, my letter of credit. I could find no trace of them anywhere. And... My door is locked from the outside. June 20th. There is work of some kind going on in the castle. Now and then I hear the faraway muffled sound of mattock and spade. And last night, the second of the predated letters which Dracula made me write, the second of that series which is to blot out the very traces of my existence from the earth went forth. Dracula. Yes, my young friend. Well, what of me? When am I free? 
When can I leave this place? Free? Mr. Harker, you're always free. You want to leave? Would you like to leave tonight? Yes, yes, in God's name. My dear young friend, not an hour shall you wait in my house against your will. Come, follow me. Hmm. The door seems to be bolted. How strange. The door is locked. Well, in God's name, open it. As you will, Mr. Harker. You English have a proverb which is very close to my heart. Welcome the coming, speed the parting guest. Good night, Mr. Harker. <laughs> The door is shut, Mr. Harker. I take it. We will remain. Morning, June the 30th. These may be the last words I ever write in this diary. Oh, God preserve my sanity. I have never seen Count Dracula by day. At sunrise, at the first cock crow, he is gone. I... I don't understand these things. I only know that the wolves obey him, and that he is a man with hair on the palm of his hand, with sharp teeth, and no blood in his face. He casts no shadow. He cannot be seen in a glass, and he moves like a bat across the sheer face of the castle walls. He eats no food, and is mortally afraid of the crucifix. As I write this, I hear in the courtyard the rolling of heavy wheels and the cracking of whips. And there is in the passageway below a sound of heavy boxes being set down. Boxes shaped like coffins. And I know what they hold. Boxes are filled with holy earth from the chapel beneath the castle. It's the last box being nailed down. And now I hear the heavy feet tramping again. The door shut. The chains rattle. In the courtyard and down the rocky way, the roll of heavy wheels, the crack of whips. Help! 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 The wagons have gone. I'm alone in the cut. I'm alone in the cut. I'm alone in the cut. I'm alone. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dr. Seward. Mr. Harker's journal terminates at this point. I now present in evidence a clipping dated August 8th of that year from the Yorkshire Telegraph from our correspondent in Whitby. One of the greatest and suddenest storms on record is experienced here today. The weather has been somewhat sultry, but Saturday evening was fine. The band was playing. The piers were crowded with holiday makers. The wind fell away entirely during the evening, and there was a dead calm. There were but few lights at sea. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner under full canvas, which was seemingly going westward. A little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea, and high overhead the air began to carry a strange, faint, hollow booming. Then, without warning, the tempest broke. And there, with all sails set, was the foreign schooner rushing with terrific speed toward the shore. A searchlight was turned on her. And there, lashed to the helm, was a corpse. With drooping head which swayed horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. A moment later she crashed. And then a strange thing was seen. At the very instant she touched, a huge dog sprang up on deck from below and running forward jumped from the bow onto the sand and making straight up the east cliff toward the graveyard vanished into the night. The coast guard going aboard at dawn found the dead man fastened to a spoke of the wheel. Tightly clutched in one hand was a crucifix. The man must have been dead for quite two days. In the pocket of the dead man's coat was found a bottle, carefully corked, containing a roll of paper. This proved to be an addendum to the ship's log. It was found on board only a small amount of cargo and that of a most unusual nature. Apparently the ship carried nothing but earth. Common earth. Packed away in wooden boxes. Shaped much like coffins. Demeter. Russian flag, Black Sea, to Whitby. July 6th. 
finished taking in cargo, a clear cargo, boxes of earth. At noon, set sail, east wind, fresh, crew, four hands, two mates, cook, and myself, captain, July 11th. Entered Bosporus. At dark, passed through Dardanelles. Mate reported in morning that one of crew, Valjoden, was missing. Took Larbert watch eight bells last night. She was relieved by Chilean and came to his bunk. There's something aboard oh. this ship. No, no. <laughs> Don't laugh, Captain. In the rain last night, oh. a tall, thin man go up companion way and along the deck forward and disappeared. When I go to the bow, no one. And the hatchways, all closed. July 22nd. Rough weather last three days. All hands busy with sails. No time be frightened. Past Gibraltar and out through straight. All well, July 24th. Last night, another hand was lost. He disappeared. Like the leeches. Leave off watch midnight. Then we never see him again. What's double watch now? If I don't take watch alone no more. Double watch. Double watch. July 29th. Had single watch tonight as crew too tired to double. When morning comes... Hey! Hey, below! Come on, Lee! Come on, Lee! He's following me below! Balancing God! Oh, balancing God like the others! Like all the others! The mate and I have agreed to go armed henceforth, July 30th. Last night, we are nearing England. Weather fine. All sails set. Captain! Captain! The man in the watch is the sails missing! Most missing! Now, only self and mate and one hand left to work ship. August 3rd. Two days of fog and not a sail sighted. At midnight, I went to relieve the man at wheel, and when I got to it, found no one there. It's here. I know it now. I saw it, like a man, tall and thin and ghastly pale. It was in the bars looking out. I gave us the knife, and my knife went through it. What? Empty as air. What is it? What are you talking about? It's here, and I'll find it. It's in the hole, in one of those boxes of earth. I'll unscrew them one by one and see. And see. He is mad. Stark raving mad. It's no use my trying to stop him. He can't hurt those deep boxes. They are in voice that common earth. <laughs> He's there. Down in the hole. I know the secret now. The sea will save me from him. That's all that's left. That's all that's left. August 4. I am all alone on my ship. And still the fog. I dared not go below. I dared not leave the helm. So here all night I stayed... And in the dimness of the night, I saw it. I saw him. God forgive me, but the mate was right to jump overboard. It was better to die like a sailor in the blue water. But I am captain, and I must not leave my ship. I shall tie my hands to the wheel when my strength begins to fail. And along with them, I shall tie that which it dare not touch, my crucifix. I am growing weaker, and the night is coming on. God and the Blessed Virgin help a poor ignorant soul trying to do his duty. Telegram, Seward, Persuit, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. Lucy was Tenra in alarming condition. Cannot diagnose. Come at once. Seward. Telegram, Van Helsing, Amsterdam, to Seward, Persuit. I'm on my way to you. Please arrange the examination immediately my arrival, Van Helsing. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm to now explain that six months before the events recorded here, 
I had become engaged to a young lady, Lucy Westenra. We were to have been married in the spring. My old teacher, Professor Van Helsing, arrived at four the next afternoon. I took him at once to Lucy's house. She lay in a bed asleep. She was ghastly, chocolate pale. The red seemed to have gone even from her lips and gums. And the bones of her face stood out. Young miss is bad. Very bad. She must have blood or she will die. Yet she is not anemic. The qualitative analysis of her blood gives quite normal conditions. It is strange. I do not like to think how strange. Look! My God, her throat, look! The black velvet band that she always wore had dragged up a little and showed a red mark on her throat. Just over the external jugular vein were two punctures, not large, but not wholesome looking. The edges were white and worn looking. Well? Well, what is it, Professor? What's wrong with her? Speak frankly, you can tell me the worst. I wish I could, Stuart. I wish I could. But I do not dare. But won't you tell me any, anything? I will tell you this. Your young lady is in a danger greater than death. You must believe me. If you leave her for one moment and harm the false, you will not sleep easy thereafter. September 8th. I sat up all night with Lucy. Arthur, I'm afraid. My dear, you can sleep tonight. I'm here watching you. Nothing can happen. And I promise if any sign of bad dreams, if I see anything, I'll wake you at once. You will? Will you really? Then I'll sleep. I sat all night by her bedside. She did not wake once during the night, although the vows or a bat or something flapped almost angrily against the window panes. September 11th. Still quoting from my private journals. It was this time that I received a message from Perfleet. Read 10.20 p.m. St. John's Hospital. Serious complications. Case 891. Your immediate presence, London. Imperative. I had no choice. Sometime later, a paper was found among Lucy Westenra's belongings. I write this and leave it to be seen so that no one may by any chance get into trouble through me. I went to bed as usual, taking care that the window was closed, as Dr. Van Helsing had directed. About two in the morning, I awakened. I went to the door, called out. Arthur! Arthur! There was no answer. Something's broken the window. I'm in the room, alone. I dare not go out. The house seems empty. The air is full of specks, floating, circling in the draft from the window. And the light burns blue, dim. What am I to do? Something very sweet and very bitter all around me. Nothing sinking into deep water. And it's singing in my ears. You shall be flesh of my flesh. Blood of my blood. Ah. September 12th. Late. Only resolution and habit can let me make an entry tonight. We found her sprawled on the floor. There was a draft in the room from the broken window. Her throat was bare, showing the two wounds, looking horribly white and mangled. We are too late, my friend. We have failed. God's will be done. She's dying. Yes. She's dying. Stay beside her. It will make much difference, mark me. Whether she dies conscious or in her sleep. It was late in the afternoon before she opened her eyes. Arthur, oh, my love, I'm so glad you've come. I took her hand and knelt beside her. Her breath came and went like a tired, peaceful child. 
And then the light from the setting sun fell on her face, and then, insensibly, a strange change came over her. Her eyes grew suddenly dull and hard. Her breathing was heavy. The mouth opened, and the pale gums drawn back made the teeth look large and sharp. Arthur, oh, oh, my love, I'm so glad you've come. Kiss me. Then, darling, kiss me. Not for your life. Not for your living soul and hell. <laughs> Lucy! She's dead. Poor girl. There's peace for it, last. Not so. It is only the beginning. Wait and see. Westminster Gazette, September 25th. A Hempstead mystery. The Kensington Horror, the stabbing woman, and the woman in black are vividly recalled to mind by a series of events that have taken place recently in the neighborhood of Hempstead. Several cases have occurred of young children straying from home or failing to return from their playing on the heath. In all these cases, the children have given us their excuse that they have been with a beautiful lady who offered them chocolate. In each case, the child was found to be slightly torn or wounded in the throat. The wound seemed such as might be made by a rat or a small dog. The Hempstead Horror. Another child injured by the beautiful lady. He has just received intelligence that another child missed last night was only discovered late in the morning. It has the same tiny wound in the throat. Well, Stuart, what do you think of that? Do you mean to tell me, my friend, that you still have no suspicion as to what poor Lucy died of? No, there's frustration. Oh, great loss and waste of blood. And how was the blood lost or wasted? You are a clever man, my friend, and a good doctor. But you do not believe that there are things that you cannot understand... You're wrong, Stuart. Are you aware of all the mysteries of life and death? Can you tell me why in the pampas there are bats that come at night and open the veins of cattle and horses and suck dry those veins? Hmm? How in some islands of the western seas there are bats which hang on trees all day and then when the sailors sleep on deck because it is hot, split down on them and then in the morning are found dead men as wise as Miss Lucy was? I understand none of these things. After tonight, Stuart, if you dare to come with me, perhaps then you will understand. September 29th. Before dawn. Now it is done. And I would sooner die a thousand deaths than live again to what I did this night. We will spend the night you and I here in this churchyard where Miss Lucy is buried. We enter the tomb. Then we open the coffin. You shall yet be convinced. Take care, Van Helsing. Miss Lucy is dead. Is it not so? Then there can be no wrong to her. But if she is not dead, in some difficulty, we found the West End our tomb. I took up my place behind a yew tree. On one side of the tomb, Van Helsing on the other. Killed and frightened. Suddenly, I saw something moving between two yew trees. A dim white figure which held something at its breast. The figure stopped. I could not see the face, so it was bent down over what I saw to be a fair haired child. There was a sharp little cry, such as a child gives in sleep, or a dog as it lies before the fire. And dreams. Then the thing saw us. She drew back with an angry snarl. The lovely blood stained mouth grew to an open square. If ever a face meant death, I saw it at that moment. Then suddenly she turned and vanished in the direction of the tomb. Child is not harmed. We leave him in a safe place where the police find him. There's more to do. Come. Now we were in the tomb. Then in the coffin. The thing lay. 
like a nightmare of Lucy, the pointed teeth of blood-stained mouth. Then Hilti never looked up. From his bag, he took out a book, his operating knives, a heavy hammer, and a round wooden stake, some two or three inches thick, sharpened to a fine point, and hardened over a fire. Do it! The life of this unhappy woman is just begun. Then she become what you call undead. There comes with the change the curse of immortality. She cannot die, but must go on age after age, adding new victims. Because all that die from the praying of the undead become themselves undead and prey on others. So the circle goes on, ever widening as the ripples from a stone thrown in the water. But if this lady, this undead, be made to rest as true dead, then the soul of the poor lady whom we love shall be again free. Tell me. What am I to do? Take this stake in your left hand. The hammer in your right. Yes. Yeah. Place the point over the heart. Yes. Yeah. Then, then I begin the prayer for the dead. In God's name, strike. Yeah. Are you ready? Now. Domine Jesu Christe. Fili de vivi, qui manus tuas ex voluntate patri. On the morning of July 11th, a man was found on the border of Transylvania. He talked wildly of wolves and boxes of earth and blood. He gave his name as Jonathan Harker. In the hospital at Salzburg, he improved sufficiently to make possible his removal to England. I'm still quoting from my own personal papers. But there his condition remained so serious that he was committed for observation to a private ward in my hospital at Percy. Here he did so well that in three weeks he was completely recovered. It was during this time that his wife, Minna Harker, brought to the attention of Dr. Van Helsing and myself the journal that her husband had kept while a prisoner in the castle of a certain Count Dracula in Transylvania. I have before me the record of a meeting that took place in my study in Pursuit, transcribed by Mina Harker. October 1st. Meeting began soon after 8. Jonathan next to me. Dr. Seward opposite to Van Helsing at the head of the table. My friend, there are such things as vampires. Had I known at first what now I know... One so precious life had been spared to many of us who love her. The vampire which is amongst us is of himself so strong that he can direct all the elements. The storm, the fog, the thunder. He can command all the meaner things. The moth and bat, the owl and the fox and the wolf. How then are we to begin our strike to destroy him? How shall we find his place? And having found it, how can we destroy him? My friends, it is a terrible task that we undertake. To fail here is not mere life or death. If we fail, we become as him. Foul things of the night, as him. What do you say? I answer for myself. Come me in. I'm with you. The professor laid a small golden crucifix on the table. We took hands and our solemn pact was made. My friends, we too are not without strength. The vampire flourishes on the blood of the living. Without this, he cannot live. He throws no shadow. He makes no reflection in a mirror. He can transform himself to a wolf, to a bat. He can come on moonlight rays as elemental dust. He can see in the dark. He can do all these things. Yet he is not free. His power ceases at the coming of the day. Then, until night, he must remain in the shape in which he finds himself. And except in his coffin home, in those earth boxes he cannot rest. When we can confine him in his coffin, then, my friends, if we obey what we know, we will destroy him. At that moment, something sat wildly against the window, then... Did you hit it? I don't know. We looked out of the window. Against the black sky, we could see nothing. 
data in our position. From the Count's castle in Transylvania to Whitby came 50 boxes of earth. All of these, to our certain knowledge, were delivered at Carfax. Recently, 12 of these boxes have been removed. First step, ascertain whether all the rest remain in the deserted house next door or whether any more have been removed. We must trace each of these boxes and sterilize the earth with holy water so that he can no longer seek safety in it. And we must hurry. The events of the next few days are described in Jonathan Harker's journal. Till the second, 5 a.m., just returned from the empty house. Left Mina here at home. Well, we've done our work at Carfax. The place was filthy. The air stagnant and foul and alive with rats. We counted the boxes. Only 38 of them. And over each one, the professor went through his same mysterious work. It was dawn when we got back. I found Mina asleep. She looks paler than usual. October 2nd. Soon after they left, I fell asleep. I remember hearing the sudden barking of the dogs. And then there was silence. I got up and looked out of the window. There was a thin streak of white mist moving across the grass along the wall of the house. It dawned on me that the air in the room was heavy and dank and cold. The gaslight came only like a tiny red spark through the fog. I could see through my eyelids. The mist grew thicker and thicker. Then, as I looked, the spark divided. You seem to shine on me through the fog like two red eyes. You shall be flesh of my flesh. Blood of my blood. Blood of my blood. <sighs> October 2nd, 8 p.m., we on the track. Twelve boxes were delivered last week to an empty house at 347 Piccadilly. My dear friend, until the sun sets tonight, Dracula must retain whatever form he now has. We have this day to hunt out all his lairs and sterilize them. Then he will have no place where he can move and hide. But we have only until sunset. The house in Piccadilly was empty. At the one at first, it's the same... Thickening smells in the air. On the table, we found a clothes brush, a brush, and a comb, and a basin. The latter containing dirty water, which was reddened as if with blood. The boxes are back here. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. Only eleven. There's a twelfth box somewhere. Gentlemen, it is after six. The sun is setting. We've no time to lose. He will return at any moment. Open the boxes. Quiet. <coughs> It is he! The window! You waste your bullet, gentlemen. You think you better me. You with your pale faces all in a row like sheep in a butcher. You think you have left me without a place to rest. But I have more. The time is on my side. The one you love is mine already. I have known her. Already my mark is on her throat. Flesh of my flesh. Blood of my blood. She is with me always. Over land. Or sea. October 4th morning. Another meeting in the study of Turkey. We must find that last remaining box, gentlemen. We must find it. As long as that earth exists in pure, as long as there remains one place of refuge for Dracula, there is no safety and no peace for any soul in England. And for the undead, never peace so long as he lives. Blood of my blood. Blood of my blood. Mina! How do you know that? How do you know that? Quiet. With me. With me always. Over land and sea. Mina, darling, how did you know that Dracula said those... I don't know. The word just came. Strange. There are times when somehow I feel that I'm with him. At sunset? Yes. Just at sunset. 
And again at sunrise. Dr. Van Helden, if I could... If that time, you... Have you the courage? Courage for what? What do you mean? Dr. Van Helden here will question her. I will question her, yes. In a state of hypnosis. The one you love is already mine, he said. She is with me always, over land or sea. Ah, Count Dracula. Perhaps she will betray you if she is really with you, this one we love. Who knows? If she is really with you over land or sea. Blood of my blood. Nina. Yes. Answer me, Nina. Are you with him? Yes. I am with him. Where are you? I do not know. It is all dark. What do you hear? The lapping of water. I can hear it on the outside. Then you are on a ship? Yes. What else do you hear? There is the creaking of an anchor what chain. What are you doing? Still. Oh, so still. It is like death. It is like death. Here is a report from Matt and Peabody. Ship brokers. Dated October 5th, according to Lloyd's List, the only sailing ship that left for the Black Sea yesterday was the Varina Katrina, bound for Varna. Some hours before she sailed, a man came alongside, all in black, driving a cart with a great box in it. This he lifted down single-handed and carried below. No one remembers having seen him after that as heavy mist came up over Doolittle Dock until sailing time. The rest of London Harbor remained completely clear. Our plans are made. The average sailing time from London to the Black Sea is three weeks. We can travel overland to the same place in three days. We shall be there waiting for him when he arrives. October 15th, arrived barn about five o'clock. Mina seems stronger. Every morning before sunrise and just before sunset, she speaks to Van Helsing in a trance. Are you with him, Mina? Tell me, are you with him? I am with him. What can you see? Nothing. All is dark. What can you hear? I can hear the waves lapping against the ship and the water rushing by. The wind is high. I can hear it in the shrouds and the bow through the back of foam. So, the Varina Katrina is still at sea, hastening on her way to Varna. The Count cannot cross warning water, so he cannot leave the ship without being observed. What do you hear, Mina? A whole week of waiting. Daily telegram from Lloyd. Not yet reported. 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 Rushing water and creeping mud. Darkness. Darkness and wind. October 24th. Telegram. Lloyd, London to Harker. Sorry, Nick, as we know, reported this morning. The Dardanelle. Lloyd, London to Harker, October 28th. Sorry, Nick, as and heavy fog reported entering Galat Harbor at 1 o'clock today. Galat! Galat is 38 hours from here, and the first train for Galat leaves at 6.30 tomorrow morning. My friends, we have lost... I am with him. I can see nothing. Nothing. I can hear men's voices calling in the roar and creak of the world.
Garrick. So, Captain Serena Casina. A man come aboard with an order an hour before sunup. To receive a box for a party by the name of Dracula. That is better to read. Uh, Emmanuel Hillsheim, his name was. Mr. Hillsheim? Yes. You went out of the box yesterday. I gave it to Kyloff by order. Kyloff. Mr. Kyloff? I know. This morning they find him dead inside the churchyard of St. Peter. They find him dead with his throat torn open. October 30th evening. There are two ways in which Dracula can get back to his own place. By land or by water. We've examined the map and find the most likely river is the Ceres. You and I, Seaward, will charter a steam launch and follow him up the river. Van Helsing and Mina will take the train to the Resti, and from there they will... From there we shall go in the track where Harker went from district over to Borgo. If you have not caught him before, we shall be awaiting Dracula there. We arrived at the rest at noon, then Helgen and I. Bought the carriage here, and we start in an hour. Our enemy is still on the river. October 31st. We can run a good speed up the river at night. There's plenty of water, and the banks are wide apart. November 1st, evening. No news all day. We hear that a big boat went up the river before us, going at more than usual speed. November 4th. All day driving. The country gets wilder as we go. By morning, we shall reach the Borgo Pass. November the 4th, evening. We've left the launch. We've got horses and we follow on the track along the river. We are armed. Look! Quick! There they are now! Heading west! With the dawn, we could see the Slovaks some miles before us, dashing along the river with their wagons. On this is the great box. Far off, beyond the white waste of snow, was the river like a black ribbon curling. Between us and the river, not afar off, came a group of men, mounted slovaks, hurrying along. In the midst of them was a wagon which swept from side to side. On the wagon was a great box. Look! We see two horses, following fast, coming up from the south. Stuart and Hart. The slovaks with their heavy wagons are losing their guard. Now the horsemen are not more than a mile behind. Now the wagon is quite close to us. You can see the grey box swaying gravely. Now they are almost upon us. Now has happened a strange thing. The wagon smashed into a great rock dead in the snow, lost its front wheels, and turned over on its side, jammed against the stone. The horses tore loose from their places and bolted, and the slow bucks scatter and vanish after them. Then silence. Silence like comes uh, after ringing a bell. Look. It's the face. It is Dracula. Walled out stiff and twisted in the smear of his own holy earth. The box, in falling, has emptied the dirt onto the snow. His face is old looking. The skin is like paper. But to Seward, there's no time. Look at the sun. Sunday. In one minute, there's darkness, and he is forever lost to us. Have you the stake of wood and the hammer? Yes. Now, Stuart, pray for us. Kneel down and pray. Harker, the stake of wood over his heart. Be not afraid, Harker. Do not look into his eyes. The hammer. Now, Harker, strike. Strike. Flesh. Flesh of my flesh. Guilt of my guilt, death of my death, speak and be manifest in the instant of your master's peril. Elements of darkness, rain, evil wind, mist, and mold, and tempest. Right! The others couldn't, but somehow I can hear him. Behind his eyes. Claw, wing, tooth, scale, tissue of flesh, death of my death, dead and undead. The hand of the living is over your master. Console him, my children. This instant is no longer. 
in a space between two heartbeats. But the night is not here, and I am lonely. Come to your master, my children. Beguile him now in the instant of his peril. Beguile him with the sound of your names. Claw. Wing. Tooth. Scale. Tissue of flesh. Break, Arthur, break! There is one very dear to me who has not answered. My love. Mina. There is less than a minute between me and the night. You must speak for me. You must speak with my heart. Give them to me! Jonathan, give them to me! The stick of wood and the hammer! Arthur! I shall never forget that moment. The look on poor Mina's face as she stood there, the angry scar standing out on her throat, her eyes like living coals in the last red of the sunset. She had torn the stake and the hammer out of my hands with the strength of an enemy. Mina, do you know what you've done, woman? You know what you've done to us? You've released him, the evil is speaking. Look! The sun! As we looked down at Dracula, the eyes saw the sinking sun, and the hate in them turned to triumph. Flesh of my flesh, come to me, my love. Come into the night and the darkness. You have served me well, my love, my bride, my... Ladies and gentlemen, all the evidence in this case is now before you. I've added nothing. And to the best of my knowledge, I've omitted nothing that might help to throw light on the extraordinary events of the year 1891, which culminated on that terrible evening in the Volga Pass. There remains only this one last report. When Nina Hager seized the stake and hammer from her husband, I believe she was under some form of hypnosis. She herself remembers nothing. But whatever influence was at work on her, she must at the last moment have rejected it. For at the exact instant the sun disappeared, it was Nina Harker who drove the stake through the heart of the thing that called itself Dracula. At that same instant, even as we looked, the wound on the side of her throat was no more. As for Dracula, before the scream of the creature had died from our ears, the whole body crumbled into dust and passed from our sight. In that final moment of dissolution, there was in the face a look of peace, such as I never could have imagined might have rested there. Tonight's production of Dracula by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater was the first of nine CBS broadcasts in which this brilliant group will bring to life a series of great narratives, all presented in the immediacy of the first person singular. In presenting them each Monday evening at this time during the summer season, the Columbia Network is bringing a complete theatrical producing company to the air for the first time. And now here is the director to tell you about next week's Mercury Theater production, Mr. Orson Welles. Ladies and gentlemen, what are your favorite stories? If there's one you're particularly fond of and would like to hear on the air, will you please write me about it? Next week, the Mercury Theater is going to tell you Robert Louis Stevenson's exciting yarn about pirates and the sea, Treasure Island. Until then, just in case Count Dracula has left you a little apprehensive, one word of comfort. When you go to bed tonight, don't worry. Put out the lights and go to sleep. It's all right. You can rest peacefully. That's just a sound effect. There. Over there in the shadow, see? It's nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. I think it's nothing. But always remember, ladies and gentlemen, there are wolves. There are vampires. Such things do exist.
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.